There is no doubt that the workshop is confusing. Worry not, I've got a comprehensive guide to help you get through all of the troubles of my favorite new feature to come to Overwatch. My name is Nate, and welcome to Blizzard Guides. I'm going to keep this video pretty simple, there's just two sections. First, I'm going to explain all the little small building blocks for programming, and then I'm going to walk you through two game modes, Teabag to Kill and Hero Gauntlet. I'm not going to talk about absolutely everything in the first section, because that would be boring. I'll introduce some of the workshop stuff while we're working on the game modes as well, so that's why I'll have this timestamp menu right here, so you can skip to an individual explanation if that's all you want and you don't really care about everything else, and if you're not trying to become a workshop aficionado, so go ahead and just skip to making the game modes. I'll put timestamps that lead back to the first section if I'm talking about something specific there and you want to know more about that topic because you skipped the first part. Kind of like what I'm showing on screen right now. So with that said, let's hop into this video. The first section isn't actually going to be useful for just the workshop alone. If you want to make some Minecraft mods, computer viruses, or a smart fridge or something like that, you're going to be using most of these concepts, so if that's your kind of thing, you're in the right place. So to start us off, let's talk about variables. It sounds a bit weird, but it's just a label for a thing, or a, a container for some sort of information you want to store. Variables are just pretty much the basis of anything that runs on a computer. It's pretty much just the memory of the program, whether that's your Minecraft mod or workshop game mode. Variables can be your damage dealt, your health, your team score, the position of the objective, how many times your mercy dies to the widow because she just stands still, all sorts of things like that. They can be numbers, words, lists, positions, heroes, and so much more. As a matter of fact, let's actually get into each type of variable. The workshop deals with six and a half types of variables. I'll explain the half in the end. To start us off, numbers. Numbers are, wait for it, numbers. That This is just the variable type that you'll use the most. In the workshop they can have decimals or not have decimals, and you can add, subtract, multiply, divide, and do a bunch of stuff like you can with real life numbers. Who would have guessed? After that, Booleans. Now, in true programming fashion, it wouldn't be a simple concept if we didn't give it a weird and confusing name. Boolean just literally means a variable that is either true or false. So, an example would be, if you're using ult, that would be true or false. If you're crouching, that would either be true or false. And if I'm bad at the game, that's just true, because I'm pretty bad. Then after that we've got arrays. Arrays are just lists of things. You can have a list of players in your lobby, list of heroes, list of lists, whatever you want it to be. Arrays have two parts to them, the value and the index. The value just means what you've got stored in that list, so like the examples before, it's the players in the list, it's the heroes in the list, and so on and so forth. The index, on the other hand, is the position in the list. The only thing is that you actually start counting from zero, so the first hero is zero, the second is one, the third is two, and you get the idea. Like with numbers, how you can add, you can actually append to an array, which just means adding something to the end of the list. So if you had a list of players and somebody joined, the game is appending a hero to that list, so to speak. Then after that, you can actually filter an array, which will just remove things from the list based on some conditions. So if you took an array of players on your team and filtered them by who's just losing and doing really bad, you'd actually be solo queuing. And after that, you can actually sort an array, which sorts the array, obviously, I guess. And then also finally, you can slice an array, which takes a piece of the array and makes a new array. There's actually a bit more you can do with arrays, and you'll actually get to see that when we're making the game modes. Next up after that is vectors. For those of you who have taken higher level maths, you'll remember this from that or maybe your physics class. They're just a triplet of numbers labeled X, Y, and Z. This is used for stuff like position, rotation, velocity, acceleration, and much more. For those of you that are actually familiar with vectors, you have access to the dot products, cross products, and much more, and for those of you who aren't familiar, you won't be needing vectors, and I don't want to bore you with all this stuff, so we'll actually just keep moving along. After that, we've got the hero variable type. Heroes are just heroes, that's really it, there's not much else. That's obviously an Overwatch only thing, but it's basically just some constant thing that says, hey, this is a hero and that hero is Anna, or whatever hero you want it to be, it can obviously only be heroes that are from Overwatch. So for example, the hero that you select in the game is stored as a variable type that is the type hero, and hopefully that hero isn't break. Yeah, break means you guys are a little bit of a weird one. 
And finally, last but not least, we've got the player variable type. This actually refers to the actual player in the lobby. The player has his own hero, his own HP, his own abilities, etc. You'll actually be using this in pretty much every single workshop rule and action. And actually, for those of you who are a bit more attentive than the rest, you may have noticed that the player actually has his own variables too. So here's a curveball, variables can actually hold more variables in certain situations, which are actually referred to as objects, which if you ever decide to get into programming is something called object-oriented programming, or at least it gets used in object-oriented programming. Objects are just variables that have their own properties, which are variables, and players are just objects that have properties which are more variables. But you don't really need to worry about that for the workshop, so you can erase that from your brain if you want to. Oh, and also about that half of a variable type that I mentioned earlier, there's the null type of variable, which just means the nothing type. It doesn't mean zero or empty, it just means nothing. If you ever want to erase a variable, you would set it to null, or if you wanted to check if something didn't exist, you'd check to see if that thing was equal to null. This will be more obvious the more that you tinker with the workshop, but for now, just remember it as the nothing variable type. But with that, we've covered variables. That's all stuff that you'll understand the more that you use the workshop, so let's move on and get started with our game modes. But actually, you've been debated. Before we start with that, we're gonna use the teabag to kill as a way to explain the rest of the workshop, so we're not actually done with that first section. To start any workshop project, the best bet is to figure out all of the small little functions that make up your game. Since we're gonna be starting with teabag to kill, let's break that down into a few main components so you can get an idea of how to start any sort of game mode that you want to make. In this case, first off, we'll make it so that any shot by Anna will force an enemy to fall asleep. So simply put, if you deal damage, the victim should be knocked down or fall asleep. And the second part of the puzzle will be that if you are crouching near a player that is sleeping, they should be killed. And that's actually it. So now let's hop into the workshop and take a look at what we have to tinker with. Looks pretty boring at first, but let's actually take a look at the rules and what the heck those are. Rules are actually just the rules of the game. So the stuff that we broke the game mode down into earlier actually becomes our rules. So the first one becomes the first rule and the second one becomes the second rule, but actually a rule alone is useless. There are three parts to a rule that actually makes things start happening. First off, there are the actions. Actions are things that happen in the game. If you want to kill all players, you just create an action called kill and set the players to be killed all players, which will kill all players. There's a lot of actions that you can pick from, things like set status, create HUD menus, create effects, and a whole bunch more. This is actually where you'll spend the most time in the workshop. After that is the conditions. Conditions are basically what limits when an action can happen. Let's say that you want to only kill players when you use a voice line. You'd put in a condition that says, is communicating any voice line equals true, which would cause whatever action to happen only when the event player is communicating any voice lines. But event player. What do you mean by event player, Mr. Nate? Well, let's actually talk about events. Events are where the condition action pairs happen. There are three types of events currently, the ongoing global, the ongoing each player, and the player events. Ongoing global events happen when the game starts. So if you have actions in an ongoing global event, they'll happen right as the game starts up, or if you have conditions, they'll happen every time the conditions become true. The ongoing each player works kind of like the ongoing global, except the actions happen whenever a player joins the lobby, or of course, each time that all the conditions come true. So if you want to detect when a player is using any voice line, you'd put an ongoing each player event, which means that the workshop will trigger the actions whenever any player voice lines, and the event player is the player that actually triggered the event and started using the voice lines. So for example, if we put event player in our kill action from earlier instead of all players, this will kill the player that uses the voice line, which is pretty useful to know. And finally, the player events are pretty straightforward. They'll just wait for certain things to happen, all related to taking damage or dealing it. Event player in this case is exactly what you'd expect it to be, so if you choose player dealt damage, the event player is the player who dealt damage. However, you can also get a really cool second set of player variables which you can use, which are the attacker and victim. Attacker always means the player dealing damage or doing the killing, and victim, as you can probably guess, is the player taking the damage or doing the dying, which is generally your teammates whenever you're playing any sort of game mode. 
And with that, we've covered the basics of the workshop. You can actually now try and haggle together your first game mode, or you can stick along and figure out how to do some other cool things by following along and making two awesome game modes. Since we're starting with Teabag to Kill and we already know what rules we're gonna have, let's create our first rule. First things first, we want any damage you deal as Anna to sleep an enemy. Let's call it shoot to sleep. So we want this to happen whenever I deal damage, which sounds an awful lot like the player deals damage. Create our first rule. We'll try that first. We can limit it by team, but that's not really useful to us right now, so we'll ignore it. Next step is to create an action to set the status of the victim of our crime. Hit the add button and then select the action titled set status. This action allows me to sleep, hack, stun, or whatever a specific player or group of players. We want to set the status of the victim here, so select victim under the player section, and our assister, which means the person who made the victim fall asleep, will be the attacker, and the status obviously will be asleep. So let's put that to 5.5 seconds like the real deal, and hit OK, and that's our first rule done. Let's test it. So it works pretty well. You shoot an enemy and they fall asleep, exactly like we set it to work. Now we need to add the part where you kill the enemies that you teabag. For this one, let's create a new rule called teabag damage. For every player in the lobby, we want to check to make sure that you're crouching near a player on the opposite team that has the status sleeping, because we don't want to kill our teammates. Since we're going to be checking for crouching across all players, we select the event on going each player. The first condition we can add is just is crouching. Is crouching test to see if the player we say is actually crouching. I mean, it's pretty obvious. The player in this case is event player. So we've got a crouching event player equals true, which is pretty straightforward. It just checks to see is crouching event player is in fact true. Next, we need to make sure that all of the players in a certain radius are asleep. This just means that any players within, let's say two meters, is asleep. First, I'll add an is true for any. This just tests an array of things. So if you have a list of all the players in a certain radius, which we're going to find in a sec, you can test to see if any one of them is asleep and then it will run true, regardless if only one of them out of, you know, 20 players is actually asleep. So let's get that array of all of the players in a certain radius by adding a players within radius command. We want the center to be the teabagging player's location, so put event player just like we did earlier. After that, change the radius to be 2. And then we only want to kill enemies of the enemy team, so put opposite team of the team of the event player. It seems like really weird wording, but it's just the opposite team of the event player. And for the line of sight check, let's just set it to surfaces only because we don't want to teabag people on the opposite side of a wall that are still within that radius. We only want to teabag people that we can see. And finally, we just want to test if any of the players in that list are asleep, which is the whole reason we put the is true for any in the beginning. So let's check if they have the status asleep. The reason I put current array element here is because that's the current player in the list that we're testing. The workshop just finds all of the players in that list, and then it goes one by one testing this condition. So we need to tell the workshop, hey, when you're going one by one, here's what you're going to be testing against. And bam, just like that, we're actually done with the conditions. And then the final part is just super easy. In the actual all we need to do is kill the enemy we found to be in the radius and asleep. We'll put a kill action here, we'll kill all the players within the radius of two, make sure that we only kill enemy players, and check to make sure that they're in the line of sight, and finally, make the killer the player that is teabagging, which is the event player. And bam, just like that, you have your first game mode. So to quickly summarize what we did, we created a rule called shoot to sleep, which waited for a player to deal damage, and whenever that player did do damage, it would set his victim to be knocked down or fall asleep. And then after that, we created a second rule which handles the teabag killing portion. So what it would do was it would wait until a player crouched near a knockdown player and near meaning two meter radius, and then it would kill that player. And we also made sure that we didn't kill teammates and we also made sure that it didn't kill people that were on the other side of the wall using that line of sight check. And as a challenge, make it so that once you get a kill, an effect plays. So something like a purple cloud or a sound or any sort of Thing like that. Your hint will be the play effect action that will help you along, but I'm not going to tell you exactly how to do this. It's a challenge. You have to figure this out on your own. And now, Hero Gauntlet, or Gun Game, or whatever you want to call it. There's a few concepts from this that we need to break down. First, we need the list of heroes that we're going to go through. This is going to be an array that we predefine. Next, we're going to create a HUD, which shows the hero that is next on the list. We also want the player to be able to swap to the next hero after they get the kill. 
and that's actually it. So let's create that hero list in its own rule. Since we only need to make this list once, the ongoing global is perfect for this situation. Ongoing global with no conditions only gets run once, once the lobby starts. So let's just make that list and save it as a global variable called L. But wait, what is a global variable you might ask? A global variable is a variable that can be any number, as an array, a string, or any sort of variable data type, and many other things that can be accessed by any player or any rule at any time. It's global, it's just saved in the lobby. On the other hand, a player variable is something that only a player has specific access to, but it's the same across all players. So if you wanted to save a player score as S, all the players would have player score S, but S would be different across all the players. We'll use the player variable in a bit and I'll explain a little bit more, but anyway back to that list. Let's start with McCree. Then if you remember when I was explaining what an array was, I mentioned that you can actually append to the array. This will literally just add somebody to that list, so let's add soldiers next. Let's just modify the global variable L and append. I'm going to add a bunch more heroes myself and you can add who in in what order you want, but I'm going to do it my way. And now that we have this list, that first part is done. Let's just test it. So that was pretty anticlimactic, huh? The list really doesn't do anything for us now, since all it does is remember what order we want to go in. We need to now make this list actually do something, so let's add some rules for that. There's a few ways that we can approach this, and a few ways that I've tried, but the best way to do it is as follows. First off, we're going to have a player variable that's just a number. That number will mean the current hero that the player is on. So if that number is zero, then they're on the first hero. If they get a final blow, we'll add one to that player variable, and they'll be on the next hero. And if if you remember how our list and our arrays work, lucky for us, 0 lines up with index 0, which is the first hero, 1 lines up with the next index, which is the next hero, and so on and so forth. So long story short, that player variable is the index of where the player is in that array that we made earlier that has the list of all the heroes. So let's create a rule that says each time that the player gets a final blow, we'll add 1 to the player variable h. I just picked H for hero since I'll remember that H means what hero they're on, I mean that's pretty obvious. Then we'll write another action that starts forcing the attacker to be the next hero on that list. We'll get the correct hero by finding the correct value in the array by just using the command value in array. We want to pull it from our global variable L, which is the list of our heroes, and then we just want to set the index to be the player variable that I was talking about earlier, which represents final blows and matches up on the indexes of our hero list, and just like that we're actually done. Except once we test it, you'll know Notice that a few things are off. One, the kill feed is messed up, and two, there's no cool HUD, and three, if you commit suicide, your score actually goes down, but the current hero that you're on doesn't, so that's also a bit confusing because you can't see exactly what your score is. These are actually just bugs, and we can fix these things pretty easily. First off, the kill feed. My best guess is that the exact moment that we get a kill, we're already being forced to swap heroes, which means that the server thinks that the hero that I was playing doesn't exist, so when it goes to put the kill feed, it realizes, hey, you're not on that hero, so we can't put an attacker on the top, so let's just make it empty. To fix that, we'll just add a wait command, which makes the server wait for a set amount of time, and then actually just commit the action. I'll put it right in the code where it forces you to change heroes, and we'll actually be good to go. If we test it, I was indeed correct, and we fixed that bug, mostly because I just wrote the script and I already knew what was wrong. Next, let's fix the problem of our score. The best way to go about this is just to disable the in-game scoring and make up our own, and just make it match our in-game score tracking that we already have, which is the player variable H. To do this, let's go back to where we created our list of heroes, and we'll add an action to disable in-game scoring. Then whenever we actually get a kill, let's just modify the player score by adding 1. Now if you test it, you can see it works a whole lot better. Except for now, if you noticed from that video, if you get kills before the game starts, you'll actually start the game as the wrong hero and your score will be wrong on top of that. So let's actually fix this by tracking kills and changing heroes whenever the game is in progress, and only when the game is in progress, so all we'll do is add a condition because that sounds like a condition. It's always a good practice to track score related things only when the game mode is in progress. 
And finally, let's just add that HUD. We want the HUD to be different for every player, so we don't want you to be able to see what hero is next for me. That means that we're only going to do an ongoing each player. If we don't add any conditions, this will trigger when the player joins the lobby and only when the player joins the lobby, which is exactly what we want to happen. We want you to start with the HUD from the moment that you join the game, and we don't want to change it. We'll make it visible only to the player whose HUD it actually is, which is the event player in this case. For the header, we'll make an icon of that hero that is next. To do this, we'll actually just use a hero icon string, and then we'll grab the next hero in the list from that score of the player. So we'll get the value in the array, and the index will be the player score plus one, which is the next hero, because the player score is what hero they're currently on, and obviously the next hero isn't the hero that they're on. That's the hero icon done. Next, we'll have a subheader that displays the text next hero. This will just be a regular string, and a string is just a string of letters, it's, it's a word. Under the string, we'll just put next hero, and that's it for the subheader. And then finally, for the text, we'll just have it say the name of the hero. We'll do this exactly the same way that we did it for the hero icon, except we'll do it as a string instead of a hero icon string, so that we can just have it be the name instead of the icon. If you want to change the colors, you can, but I'm just going to leave it default. And just like that, we have the HUD. Now, let's test it again. <laughs> yeah, the lead. <sighs> Build them up. Seems to work pretty well. The only thing to note is that it kind of freaks out when it's on that last hero. So what we can do is if the player is on that last hero on the list, we delete the HUD. The best way to do this is just by adding a new rule that has the condition. If the player score is equal to or greater than that last hero in the list, destroy the HUD. We're going to have to do something a bit weird, and this part might be way too confusing for some of you guys, which is totally okay. Just do what I do. We'll have to check the player score is equal to or greater than the length of the hero list minus one. We'll have to do this because, for example, the last index in an array that has 10 items actually isn't index number 10, it's index number 9, since arrays count starting from 0 to whatever number the array count is minus 1, not 1 to the count of the array. Then we just delete the HUD by destroying the last text ID in the actions, which refers to the last HUD that we created. And then, just like that, we've actually created the official hero gauntlet that's in the arcade that Blizzard used themselves. To quickly summarize it, we created a hero list that contains all of the heroes that we're going to scroll through, and paused the score so that we could keep track of the score ourselves. We did this in a global event so that it ran only once in the beginning of the game mode and didn't ever run again. Then, each time that a player got a final blow, we updated their score, and then we forced them to start being the next hero by getting the value in the array from our list. And we also created a HUD in a separate role that gets created for a player once he joins the lobby through an ongoing each player event that works by grabbing the next hero in the list, and then it just puts it into a nice good looking HUD, and another role to delete the HUD so that it won't get glitchy on that last round. And finally, as a challenge, I want you to figure out a way to make it so that the kill leader has an indicator around them, maybe a glowing totem, or maybe they're on fire, and then also I want you to put a message on the screen whenever they reach that final round. It should be pretty easy, and I'm not going to give you any hints, but if you do need a little bit of help, I mean, shameless self-promo, you can join our Discord and ask some questions there. We, we have a really cool workshop chat. So, if that's your thing, you can do that. But anyway, that's it. That's all I have for you today. I hope this guide was helpful. It took me forever to make. I spent a lot of time trying to get this structure to be right and all these explanations to feel right. And it, it's been a difficult video to make, not gonna lie. I have a lot of experience in programming just so you guys have the background if anybody's trying to say that I'm like dumb or anything. I know what I'm talking about. I dumbed a lot of things down so that people could understand them. I used the incorrect phrasing and incorrect language. And I even said things that were wrong just for the sake of understanding so that players can go and research everything that they need. I didn't give everybody the tools to completely make any game in the world, but I gave them the tools to research and figure out these things on their own because I remember when I was learning how to mod Minecraft and stuff like that, which was a very long time ago, those resources were what helped me the most, not the resources that were accurate to the T and had every single phrase properly worded and all those weird, confusing, big terms that I still don't understand to this day. Like, what the heck does verbose mean? A lot of people use this in the programming world, but I can guarantee you most of you guys don't know what that means, and I didn't at least. So I just try to keep this as simple and as straightforward and explanatory as I could keep it. But I, I'm a Unity developer, I worked with Unreal Engine for a very long time, I do VR stuff, 
I've done multiple Android apps, like this is kind of my space. So I understand what I'm talking about. And if you guys have issues with the way I worded it, I can assure you it's just the way that I was explaining it, unless there's obviously an inaccuracy. But if you guys enjoyed this, definitely please get subscribed for this video. I really hope you guys enjoyed it. I really, really want you guys to understand it. I'll probably set something up in my Discord. If you guys want to ask questions about the workshop, I would be more than happy to help because I love doing these things. And also just check out our Discord and Twitter and Instagram if you guys want to ask questions about the workshop. That's the best way to put it. But anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this one. Have a nice day. My name is Nate, and this was Blizzard Guides.